Hello, my name is Hope Raymond and I am doing a presentation on Macbeth for the THA 401 final project. Macbeth was written by William Shakespeare somewhere between 1599 and 1606. Many sources disagree on the exact date of completion, however William Shakespeare.info believes that the finished product was probably closer to its first performance date, which is in 1606. This argument seems likely because there is a fairly accepted theory that Shakespeare wrote Macbeth for King James I and the visiting Scottish king. Since he would have had to know that the Scottish royalty was coming, I think it more likely that Shakespeare wrote the play closer to 1606. The plot of the play is very long and intricate, but from the several times I have read it, the basic summary is this. Macbeth and Banquo, pictured here, are heroes, war heroes, who run into three witches on their way back from battle, also pictured here. The witches predict that Macbeth shall be a king, and that Banquo shall be the father of kings. Macbeth sends a letter to his wife, Lady Macbeth, describing these events, which she decides should be taken very seriously. She convinces Macbeth to murder King Duncan while the king is visiting, and then they decide together that they should take over. Macbeth does this, as well as many other heinous acts, which eventually lead to him being killed by his buddy Macbeth and the crown ends up with Banquo's son, Fleance. As mentioned before, the first production of this story was in 1606. There's not a lot of information known about this show. Most, if not all, of the descriptions are pure conjecture. The most popular guesses are that the play was first performed for King James and perhaps some Scottish royalty, and that after the production, the play was banned from being performed. Another guess that is one of the favorites of theatrical people is that uh, this first production is when the Curse of Macbeth began, or the Curse of the Scottish Play. Apparently, the boy who was playing, playing Lady Macbeth fell ill with a fever very close to opening and needed an understudy, who very well might have been Shakespeare. The boy died soon after, beginning a long line of mishaps associated with this play. The play would have looked pretty basic. DigitalTheaterPlus.com makes the point that, quote, in Macbeth, there are many different lines referring to time of day that events take place or the weather. These lines all help to set the scene for the audience who would then be able to imagine these elements. The barrenness and simplicity of Shakespeare's globe is so freeing to the imagination that all you need is for an actor to walk on stage with a candle and to say, how goes the night, boy? And the audience will imagine that it's night. End quote. The performance would be during the day, so these little scenic hints from Shakespeare were necessary to help the audience understand what time a scene took place. Language also helped to clarify who each character was, especially when a woman entered. Because of the time, women characters were played by boys, so specifying that you were Lady Macbeth was very important. As for a set, the only staging elements would be the two doors, pictured here you can see on either side of the posts. Uh, two doors in the back of the stage for exits and entrances, and one door or curtain in the center back for interior scenes. This is also, you can see it slightly behind the left-hand post. The costumes, on the other hand, would have been quite intricate. At the time, nobility often donated their, gar their old garments to the theater, and these were used for costumes for all of the productions. These technical elements were the norm for the outdoor globe stage. However, some historians argue that Macbeth was actually written as a chamber piece. For example, in kinglear.org, some writers ask, quote, whether Macbeth was written by Shakespeare to be performed indoors. The play certainly feels like a chamber piece, with a strong atmosphere of darkness. As G.K. Hunter points out, performances at court were quite spectacular with stage machinery, sound effects, and magical illusions. And Macbeth, with its vanishing witches, ghostly apparitions, and flying witches, could lend itself well to the extravagance of such an evening." Unquote. Whether or not this was true of the first production, the next one was definitely outdoors in the Globe Theatre in 1611. There is a synopsis of this performance written by astrologer Simon Foreman. He wrote, quote, In Macbeth, at the Globe, 1611, the 20th of April, Saturday, there was to be observed, first, how Macbeth and Banquo, two noble men of Scotland, riding through a wood, there stood before them three women fairies, or nymphs, and saluted Macbeth. Foreman goes on to describe the details of the banquet scene. Next night, being at supper with his noble, whom he had bid to feast to the witch, also Banquo should have come. He began to speak of the noble Banquo, and to wish that he were there. And as he thus did, standing up to drink a carouse to him, the ghost of Banquo came, and sate down in his chair behind him. And he, turning about to sit down again, saw the ghost of Banquo, 
which stunted him so that he fell in a great passion of fear and fury. End quote. Foreman goes on to describe the play in detail. His description has led some historians to believe that the 1611 production was adapted by Thomas Middleton because some of the scenes described by Foreman had lines directly from Middleton's play, The Witch. The next notable production of Macbeth, according to Ancestry.com, was in 1660, when King Charles II took the throne. He apparently gave the play to William Davenant, pictured here, who adapted it severely, adding in musical numbers for the witches, and gave Macduff and Lady Macduff much larger roles. This version of the play was used until 1744, when David Garrick revived Macbeth using fewer adjustments to Shakespeare's original text. He did, however, keep the operatic witch scenes added in by Davenant, and he additionally cut, quote, the spurious Lady Macduff scenes, along with her infamous murder scene and the bit with the porter. Additionally, he, quote, could not resist writing a new climactic speech for Macbeth. He performed the speech as the lead for the next several years. His production boasted a more natural style of acting. In fact, one account talks of how his delivery was so urgent and real that, quote, in one performance when he told the first murderer, there's blood upon thy face, the actor in question involuntarily replied, is there, by God, end quote. This production took place in the Drury Lane Theatre, where, where, coincidentally, the next notable Macbeth also took place. Now, it would be John Philip Kemble and his sister Sarah Siddons as Lady Macbeth in 1784. Siddons had a lasting effect on the role of Lady M because of her original take on the lines and actions that had been pretty by the book until then. Her choice to put the candle down during the damn spot scene was revolutionary. J. Bowden wrote of her that, quote, she laded the water from the imaginary you over her hands, bent her body to listen to the sounds presented to her fancy, and hurried to resume the taper where she had left it, that she might with all speed drag her husband to their chamber. This, with her legendary line readings, marked her as one of the most influential Lady Macbeths of all time. In 1837, William Charles McReady took a stab at the violent role using a workmanlike point of view. This production marks the beginning of more innovative staging techniques, as well as fancier special effects, which were all the more possible because it took place in Covent Gardens. Macbeth was a part of a series of original Shakespeare text revivals done by Covent Gardens, including The Tempest and Henry IV. This large-scale revival of Shakespeare's works was the first of its kind in over 150 years. Samuel Phelps was the next to take up the torch from 1844 to 1862. Phelps was believed to have returned to the original text by Shakespeare and gotten rid of the additions made earlier by Davenant. According to Ancestry.com, he, quote, made only minor cuts and transpositions, whereas his predecessors took huge liberties in their productions. At this point, Macbeth began getting popular and was picked up with more regularity. Charles Keane and his wife Ellen Keane, or Ellen Tree, did a production of Macbeth simultaneously with Phelps that began in 1853 in the Princess's Theatre. This production was a spectacular and ran for some time. It was admired because the staging was based around historically accurate scenery and costumes. To finish off, the great productions of the 1800s was Henry Irving and Ellen Terry. Their rendition took place in the Lyceum Theatre in 1874 and then again in 1887. The most notable difference in this production in comparison to others is that Ellen Terry portrayed a more sympathetic Lady Macbeth, devoted to her husband and less powerful than past Lady M's. Also of note is that Henry Irving was the first man knighted for his endeavors in acting. By the 20th century, Macbeth had picked up steam in its popularity and was being produced pretty regularly. The coming years would be full of good productions, but as with all theater, there were some truly marvelous standouts. The first was a Macbeth based around voodoo magic in 1936. It was nicknamed Voodoo Macbeth and was of note because one, the incomparable Orson Welles directed it, and two, it was a completely African American cast during a time when racism was incredibly prevalent. Here is a clip from the play. Under the works program, musicians, artists, writers, and actors contribute their share to the cultural development of the community. The Negro Theater Unit of the Federal Theater Project produced a highly successful version of Shakespeare's immortal tragedy Macbeth, which far exceeded its scheduled run in New York, was later sent on a tour of the country. The scene was changed from Scotland to Haiti, but the spirit of Macbeth and every line in the play has remained intact. In 
in this contribution to the American theater and in other projects under the works program, we have set our feet on the road toward a brighter future. That's just a little taste of that production. It was a great success uh, in the time. It, it most especially impressive because of the time. Next, we have a production directed by Margaret Webster featuring Maurice Evans and Judith Anderson in 1941. The production was so revered that it went on to Broadway and in 1947 was presented as a live radio performance. Here is a clip from that broadcast. very different kind of production. In 1960, Maurice Evans and Judith Anderson performed the play once more in a television broadcast. These two were essentially the most popular Macbeth and Lady Macbeth for the whole mid-20th century. This is not to say that they were the only Lord and Lady Macbeth. During this time, Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee made their marks on the roles in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre production in 1955. There were varying reviews of the production. Some people loved Olivier and hated Lee, or vice versa, or they thought the production was wonderful all around. Either way, the play was not the only thing that made Olivier's Macbeth famous. He wanted to produce a cinematic adaptation that was very close to happening, but fell through at the last moments due to financial problems. Uh, many Brits believe that because this film never happened, there is a large gap in the British cinema history. After reading numerous articles, it is clear that the theatricality of this Macbeth was not the prime focus, though from pictures, as you can see here, it seems that the look was based on a pseudo-historical design, perhaps gothic. We then jump a couple decades to a production in 1976 by the Royal Shakespeare Company, directed by Trevor Nunn. Sir Ian McKellen and Dame Judi Dench, pictured here, performed a version of Macbeth that was so chilling and effective it is still used as a yardstick of success for Macbeths today. The original staging is very stark and without much frippery. None really wanted to produce a show that was strictly based on the actors. Thankfully, he had, a ma he had magnificent performers who helped garner enough success that the production was adapted and later filmed. Here is a clip from the film version. Queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died here after me. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow. And tomorrow. And tomorrow. Creeps in this 
petty pets from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have flight. Did fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, reap, camp. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour up on the stage. And then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Very chilling and effective. Now, we jump another 20 years, and we come to the next remarkable revival, revival of the Scottish play. Our leading man now is Anthony Scher, with Harriet Walter by his side. This play, like the previous one, based itself on simplicity. The costumes and set were contemporary and weren't meant to draw attention. Once again, this effect was successful enough that audiences wanted a way to watch it from afar, so in 2001, the original cast filmed a movie version of the stage production. Here is a clip from that. The clip for this does not have extremely good quality, but it's still okay enough. Queen, my lord, is dead. <laughs> she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. All our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. <sighs> Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So the same speech that Ian McKellen did, did, but you can see there are some significant differences. Finally, we come to the most recent production of note with Sir Patrick Stewart and Kate Fleetwood in 2007. Like the past two revivals, this play was revamped into a film. Unlike the other two plays, this version had a very stylistic feel. It emphasized the horror element of Macbeth, though it was still contemporary. The most notable example of this play's, play, uh, play's individuality is that the witches are these very creepy women who act as the catalyst for all of the action. Instead of high-pitched and crazy like the traditional witch, they are quiet and unfeeling, allowing for more tension in their scenes. This is perfectly exemplified by the opening scene of the film, adapted version. Oh, my God. 
trying to pump the cup on my back. Kids this way, come. Open locks. Forever locks. Very creepy. Very different from the radio version that we heard earlier. From the very start of the run of Macbeth. Uh, the actors have been the driving force for great productions, excepting the production directed by Orson Welles. Because Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are so complicated emotionally, it is illogical to try to produce the play without people who are incredibly strong actors. You will notice that in all of these productions, again, excepting Lady Macbeth, the leads did not have breakthrough performances through Macbeth. This is a play for seasoned actors who can handle the language with ease. Now... I want to switch the camera view here, but that's not going to happen. So, in my opinion, if I were to produce Macbeth, I would definitely need to be familiar with these three most recent productions. They are the standard to which we hold this play currently. For cliches, I don't think I would want overly witchy witches, like the witches in the radio version of it. I am more drawn towards the witches in the Patrick Stewart version of Macbeth, but... Uh, still, I think, I don't know, something, something along, more along those lines, but not quite that much. I find that the craggly voices and bodies tend, of the, like, more witchy type witches, tend to make the characters seem ridiculous and uninspiring. Also, I'd be interested in trying to find new depths to the Macbeth family. There is a tendency towards too much guilt or too much anger when being Macbeth or Lady Macbeth, and I think... I think both of those emotions are really important for Macbeth, but I think the emotions in between are what round the characters out and make ultimately make the show a success. So thank you for watching my present presentation on the life and death of the Scottish play. I have an extremely long document of all my sources that will be attached in the email with this video. Again, this is Hope Raymond, signing off.